I asked the Brennans for the names of the best Irish flyers, and they told me only one name popped into their heads, the name O'Mara. Here in Dublin Pigeon Circles, that means this pair, 71-year-old Bill on the left and son Jerry, 40, on the right. Over two days, we visited their individual pigeon lofts and talked about their methods. Bill has a tidy white loft in the same back garden where Jerry first learned to race, and Jerry now has his own home and small back garden operation too. As you'll hear, the amount of winning that's been going on in these locations is exceptional. But how they got here is a far different story from so many of the ones we've heard in this film. Of our friends in Germany, Belgium, and Wales, nine out of ten learn pigeon racing from their father. That deep knowledge is a big advantage over newcomers to the hobby, so you'd expect this story to be that good old Bill O'Mara somehow enticed his sons into carrying the torch for the family's winning pigeon tradition. That story would be a total fake. And it would be a fraction of the fascinating saga of how the O'Mara name came to dominate the skies of Dublin. It begins back in 82, when 12-year-old Jerry and older brother Andrew talked their mom into letting them keep a pigeon they claimed they'd found, but actually bought from a neighbor. Typical kid stuff, right? Then they slapped together a tiny loft on the wall of their garage. You can see it in the upper right-hand corner, this photo. A year later, another, slightly bigger, and then another you could actually stand inside in 1983. Father Bill doesn't know much about this. Why? He's a long-haul lorry driver, one of the very first to truck Irish beef to American bases on the continent. So while Bill was off and away, he did buy the kids six birds for starters, and lo and behold, they won their first young bird race. Remember, this is probably before Jerry's voice changed. By 85, they won the then Dublin Fed Averages Trophy, and by 1986, the teenagers took home a table full of victories. Now, if that wasn't bad enough for the proud Dublin fanciers to be beaten by kids, Bill O'Mara was about to make it much worse. When he realized how good his sons were and that the fountainhead of pigeon racing was in Belgium, he said, let's go. So in 1986, 16-year-old phenom Jerry O'Mara is being schooled by the likes of Belgian youngbird master Maurice Verhey, the already legendary Silver Toya, and many more. This educational continental trip was repeated again in 1994, where Jerry first heard about darkening. Now married, he bought a home and built the first of these lofts. By 1999, with a small team of darkened youngsters, he won nine straight races. These simple green buildings, actually commercial garden sheds he tweaked for racing, have been the scene of a trophy heist the likes of Dublin has never seen in its long racing history. In a decade, Jerry was overall South Road champ five times in second place twice. He scored 28 fed and open victories from here. At 40, this puts him on a pace to equal or exceed the North's legendary Ronnie Williamson's performance. I pieced together this history in a series of conversations with Bill, Andrew, and friends in Bill's kitchen, in Jerry's backyard, and with Bill and Jerry in the tiny stock loft they share in Bill's garage. Incredibly, the two trips to Belgium involved no bird purchases. Jerry says they were so naive, they didn't even think of it. Their earliest victories came when Bill visited the Luella pigeon stud and bought the wrong pigeons. That story, you went, you were told to buy two different breeds yeah, at Luella. At Luella. They didn't have it. Didn't have it. But no. they said, oh, by the way. Try these. Try these. Tony That's Brown the there. foundation yeah. of the stock. That's right. When I brought the six home, we actually raced them six. Little did we know, we didn't know anything about them. But put it this way, the six that we got in, 90, in 83, I would like to get the same six now, because we won with them when we didn't even know how to fly pigeons. Didn't even have to fly pigeons. And we didn't even know, when we knew what we were doing, but we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> but we went, you know I mean? we went, we No matter where they found pigeons, Jerry made them work. So what's his favorite source? Belgium? Nope. Holland? Mm-mm. How about English coal country in the mighty up north combine? Jerry describes visiting Alan Hindhoff to buy birds for 50 pounds a piece. Like if he, I can't believe he went into a stock loft and was handing them out, and I didn't know. I told you, <laughs> I told you to hand them out. We wanted to buy pigeons. He went into a stock loft and was handing pigeons out. I kept saying, Are these for sale? Or is it just to. Who, whose loft is this? It's Alan. Alan Hindhoff and Donaldson, he raced under. Yeah. Under up in our combine and bread and something. Ah, he's a legend, like, you know. Oh, he's real. He was a complete legend up there, like. And, um, He's handing these out, and I didn't know where they were for sale. So he was just putting them into a basket. But he wasn't asking for them back in. So another one come out, and if he, liked, if he didn't like to put it back in, he put it into the basket. 
I thought when he came out he was going to say, no, they're not the ones. But he said, no. I said, well, take them. And he says, right, no problem. And that was it. And he says, well, these will win for you. How many pigeons did you come back with? Cool. Ten. Ten. We nearly died. We were saying, oh, get out of here quick before. But did he, he already change his mind? He always he said... Walked out of, he, kept, oh, no, he walked out of the garden. <laughs> he walked out of the garden. he didn't know we were going to even get charged for a while. No, when you go, I said, we want these, we want these pins. And I said, we that's, thing we that's thing we ever done. That's it. I, I set up to... How much did he charge you? Today? 50 pounds each, I think. 50, 50 pounds. Pound yeah. yeah. For yeah, 10 yeah. birds. Yeah. Yeah. And they're a big part of what's here. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. They were oh, there. Yeah. At least you get the impression that this is a tale of lucky pigeon buying. Don't. Jerry once flew to Belgium for a one-day visit, picked a pair of pigeons, mated them, and raised the best young bird in all of Dublin the following year. The stock section is managed by Bill, and he gets the first round of youngsters, Jerry the second. Their race teams are simply foster parents for the eggs from the birds in here. The stock birds are a blend of fed winners, the rare and tested outcross, and the occasional unflown youngster that catches Jerry's eye. He doesn't run any pedigree software other than the computer-like recall he has in his head for every bird his dad cares for here. We visited both Jerry's and Bill's. They live far enough apart to fly in separate clubs. It was Keith who first took us to Jerry's. They're good friends, in part because they both drive taxi cabs in addition to racing pigeons. Looking at the small green buildings Jerry races from, it's a little hard to imagine the magnitude of what he's done against contests where he's sent a few pigeons against 10,000 or more. But this is it. One section for cocks, another for widowhood hens in the middle, and a young bird section on the left. The connected sheds are six feet deep and were added over the years beginning in 97. He planted the neighbor-friendly hedge then, too. There's a large adjustable vent on the end of the widowhood cock section, and the main sliding door has a trap built in. Inside the cock section, there are 21 nests, including three tiny ones sandwiched in. He never takes out his bowls, simply sliding off the wood and feed cup if he wants to motivate the cocks. A lot of attention is paid to ventilation here. The doors are vented, and Jerry can adjust the airflow up through the roof vent. Fancy? No. Functional? Yes. I'd say the same for his small traps, which Bill constructed. The landing board flips down, and he puts a small piece of wood to encourage birds to trap quickly. One or two seconds matter when 10,000 pigeons are pouring into a circle about six miles across. The small trap and door on the left lead to the widowhood hen section. Jerry uses green shade cloth for air control when the door is open. The hens have small boxes, and he can lock them in with slated doors if he wants. I call them widowhood hens because the hens exercise daily and trap back into this section. He seldom opens the small door or this large sliding door into the nest section. The hens learn that any time they go into the basket, either for training or to race, they get to trap back into the nesting section. But there's really no roundabout going on. Finally, welcome to the winningest young bird loft in Dublin. It's a deceptively simple layout. Two small aviaries bracket the entrance door. The far one opens into the main young bird section, where the single round of youngsters are darkened. The other small aviary is in an open perching area, where birds can be during the day, and this section permits a lot more airflow through wire netting. And finally, there's a tiny end section for a few late breads he wants to settle. It doesn't get much simpler or smaller than this, and it occurred to me to ask how the young birds come in and out. I, I, I design it and he builds it. And he builds it. <laughs> it's about as simple as you can get. This thing here. You see, no one ever has, no one's ever here, you know what I mean? It's just that. That just slides in and it, it, it torques it up. So standing here at the site of dozens of fed winds, I wish I could say I extracted secret after secret from this young Irish master. I had a day and a night, two days to try. But in terms of unearthing a unique system here, it was not to be. Jerry O'Mara may be an incredible champion, but he's several other things, humble and curious. He doesn't boast or bore you with results, and he asked me almost as many questions as I asked him. You've seen the humble building the winners come home to, and I wish I could give you the inside scoop on Jerry's road to success, but by his own admission, there is not much of a map for that road. Take what he looks for to know if his birds are right. What do you look for when you're when you're seeing how you're doing, in the hand, do you, do you pick them up or you? 
I do, like, but it's like every year hear so many theories about trout and all this, so I don't even, I don't even look at it now anymore. But people, better pigeon men than me, swear by it, so. But you also mostly just, are you mostly just observing the yeah, behavior? Yeah, just watching, yeah, just watching. Just making sure they're right. How active they are? Yeah. Best thing was when you fly well in the Federation and you see how good they are, then you know in your head what they're supposed to be like every year. And that's so, probably a benefit because, but if you've never been to top line with the Fed with them, then you don't really know. So when you know what they should be like, that's why I've seen that it could let them, they could be all over the place happy and people say, oh, they're grand. I say, no, they're just, you know. So once you've won, you just remember what they looked like when they won. Got that? Or how about the feeding he does and how he decides when to add or subtract grains for his race team, old or young? I couldn't write down and give you a system what I do because I don't know what I do. I just watched them, watched them myself. And you've been doing it that way year after year yeah. while you've been racking up these results. In other words, the, the system that you had five years before may be slightly different. Than I've changed, like I've changed the feed. You go to back or anywhere else and you'd see a different grain. So you buy a bag of that and you might do a couple of handfuls of that. And like it wouldn't be one set, you know. <laughs> but I, li I like the challenge of it as well. As I say, it's like in football or in snooker, they all know the next shot. So if yeah. you can feed them and then you know what the pitting should be like the next like day. It. And with the darkened second round youngsters that make up his race team, he keeps seeing new approaches that work. What will you be doing with these young birds as you're getting ready for the, for the season? You got cocks and hens. Yeah, I had together. them before, yeah. I, I done them before, I started off, they were all together. And they won, they topped the fed. I separated them and they won and topped the fed. And then I put them back together and they won and topped the fed. So now I just leave them. I've done it all. I used to have hens and cocks and the hens were actually in here and the cocks were in there and the hens flew well and these had this open. And the hens nearly won the young world averages on their own. And this, and this is really open. This is like oh, an old yeah. English, English open front loft because yeah. this is open all the way down to the ground. That's virtually 80% open open side. I mean, these are only just out the dark now, so like ra racing now will be in another month. So you would only be getting going now with these. Like, so, you, so you used to separate them. Yeah. Cocks in here, hens in here, they'd get together just before you shipped them. Yeah, yeah. Now they stay together. Mm. So as they mature, there's some of them are starting to mate up. I see yeah. they're starting to pair up in here. That's, I prefer them like that, just sitting like that. When they've had them on eggs, you seem to lose them or something. Where I prefer it when they're just happy. You could go in there and you see them like that. And then I've seen it through the race and see them like that, and they go in there and she'd be over there and he'd be there. And they just like read each other when they want. When they've been on eggs, some fellas win with them, but I don't know, seem to start to lose them, or they never do as well. I, I prefer just to have them sitting like that, happy on a perch. An article I read about Jerry put it well. His secret weapons are on either side of his head, his ears. Jerry's insatiable curiosity and quiet nature hide a mind that is a sponge for good ideas. In a group of pigeon men, he's the least likely to be doing all the talking. In fact, his constant questions have made less successful fanciers think he was insulting them. As I say, I'm forever reading on the internet and books, any latest books, doesn't matter, the latest DVDs, we get the whole lot, like, you know, yeah. it's, we don't, um, you're forever, like, you're watching DVDs and you're, you know, it's just it's what you do. I've always done it. Like, you know, I've talked to everybody. Like, I've talked to people. I talked to a fellow one time, he was a good flyer. And he actually thought I was winding up, because when I went, he was asking me a friend. He thought I was winding up, because he, he man told me well I flew. And he thought I was on. I said, no, he says, I am not talk to any good pigeon man. I said, they always learn. And for as much as he reads and watches DVDs, including those by yours truly, the more he realizes his own findings don't always tally with the opinions of other legends in the sport. What annoys me is when I watch the DVDs and you see the top pigeon men saying stuff and you say, no, like, I don't find that and yet they're better than what I am. You mean my, our DVDs? Mine? Yeah, you know, like, say, different fellas saying with fat mixtures and all that. Like, say, no, listen to the, like, I'm not saying Shellacans are probably one of the best pigeon men in the world, but he's saying stuff and saying feeding all year round where I don't. Like, I'm changing the feed all the time. And so, a young man with one of the strongest early careers of any pigeon racer on earth has more questions than he can find answers to. I hope all of you stuck in a pigeon club where the worst flyer is an advice spewing blowhard appreciate that. Later I had a chance to visit Bills again and he has a simple explanation for how Jerry wins. He's gifted. 
if he was playing football, he'd be a fantastic footballer. He'd be a Pele of this world. If he was a racing jockey, he'd be Lester Pickett. What's ironic is that if Bill wasn't winning with his own pigeons, he could take a job full time being Jerry's public relations man. I don't think I've ever met a prouder father. Jerry keeps no trophies. He literally doesn't seem to care. But Bill peels the winning plates off the big ones, gives away the trophies, and sticks the victories on all sides of the smaller trophies in his little conservatory. But part of that is not just paternal pride, but a trait of the warm and sentimental nature of the Irish. For example, in Bill's loft, where he too has more than his share of Federation victories, there's a picture on the wall. Not out there for the public, just here for Bill. It's of Alan Hindhoff and a friend. Alan, the generous source of much of the blood that is winning here, and a daily reminder that most of us owe wherever we've gotten to in this sport to others who've come before us and helped us. Now with this fellow, I may have to amend that a little. He had no family history in pigeons. He somehow picked pigeons time after time that turned into winners. He can barely explain how. Once in a while, you come across one of those rare cases where man and bird are born on the same wavelength. And in our sport, we call the human being a natural. Jerry and Bill O'Mara, Dublin.